नमो तस्स भगवतो अरहतो सम्मा संबुद्धस नमो तस्स भगवतो अरहतो सम्मा संबुद्धस नमो तस्स भगवतो अरहतो सम्मा संबुद्धस हमेश टू हिम द ब्लेसेड वन द वर्दी वन द फुली एनलाइटेड वी पे हमेश टू हिम एंड टू द डामा ओके सो व्हाट आई हैड दिस यू नो idea that what we did last time on wednesday um it was nice <laughs> we did i hope you went to see it. it we we called it dhamma in a nutshell it was put up but then when i thought about it from the angle of people who have not you know heard it before and also my dedication to making things come into a smaller and smaller piece that you can put the whole dhamma in your pocket and take it with you forever and never lose it i thought to myself well what we should do with this because it was so nice we had a lot of people write about it and say it was nice but we should examine more closely uh, the individual pieces a little bit closer because i was pushing hard on that to try to get it and then it was a 2 hour class wasn't it in the end but i think we took a bunch of that off maybe we but we were trying to push through to get everything done and i was thinking i haven't said very much about some of these pieces and why are they um why is this all causal related you know and why did i start doing this and get this in my head i had to make this all in a like very small piece so that you could always remember it why and the reason is because i want you to remember all the pieces but you won't remember all the pieces if they're taken apart and put in individual classes and you don't know the relationship why would she assume meaning me why would i assume suddenly these are causally related and we actually had somebody um look at what some of the teachers are doing now and they're changing the way that it's set up in the um it's ch they're changing the order of the classes in the retreats and this we are not hardcore you have to do it this way um not like some teachers or that way uh but on this particular point if you're going to teach i don't want you to change the order because you might have to hear it 20 times or go to go through a retreat yourself and study it more closely 10 times or 12 times but when it clicks then you'll understand all of a sudden you will understand why did i have to hear dependent origination before i heard the anatta teaching and why did i need the uh hindrances at the very beginning why did we need to go into that so hard and what's what did i what's the real, do you really have to tell me the path in 111 and that's that's a sticky one the the path part of going through the jhanas is a sticky part it's a sticky part because um when you when you uh because everybody wants to know it at by heart and you don't need to know it by heart and you shouldn't be paying attention to where you are the first time you're learning this until you go through and when you go through then you turn around and come back to go through again then you begin to want to know a little bit more about why the pieces you know and spend a little bit more time maybe in the first john and the second john and third john and fourth john what are these for you know but why should we give you too i don't think we should give you too much information because in our retreats historically bonti never talked to the person in interviews about where they were until after the fourth jhana and there turns out to be a uh causal reason for this because if you start thinking now i think i'm in the first jhana i oh wow i'm in the first jhana oh this is going <laughs> and so your very calm sitting to in meditation becomes a mental proliferation spinning thing oh i read the book that must mean i'm here oh i'm here or am i here oh gee and then you want to know why are you not moving right along with this 
Well, you're not moving along with it because you're not supposed to be doing anything, thinking anything, computing anything, analyzing anything. You're supposed to be watching. And so you're supposed to be, if you want to say, what do I concentrate on in this? Concentrate on doing nothing. <laughs> and concentrate, if you want to concentrate, let go of everything and just take it on a, on a, a uh, like a proposition, uh, proposition, what would the, what would the power of the mind be if there was nothing going on in the mind? Curious, huh? How much power, how much would, would it make a difference in my mind? or in my stress level, or in my tension level, or in my depression level, if I wasn't thinking about anything except just experiencing where I was here at the present time. Have you ever thought about that? And that's what he was thinking about as he's searching for all these answers and everything. He begins to figure out that you step back, step back, step back. And this is a brilliant thing that Adelsa came up with by saying the, instead of levels of understanding, even, or just levels or degrees or stages, he said, these are levels of cessation. And that makes perfect sense. Cessation was the word we needed for uh, the jhanas. It was brilliant because when you say that, it helps you to remember you're on your way to experiencing an experience of no experience. <laughs> experiencing an experience of no experience. That's where you're going. And what happens to the mind and medically speaking, if we wired you up, what happens to the body and the mind when you allow yourself to let go of all this weight, you know, what happens? I just saw pictures this morning. I called my son last night, told him what was going on, ah, you know, and he heard me and then he was almost crying and then he heard me again, <laughs> said the same thing again. And then I said, now, sweetie, you know, calm down. Everything's fine. You know, we're on a good journey here. My little lesions that are all in my body, they don't like critical organs. Try to keep this in your mind. My lesions do not want to eat critical organ matter. <laughs> and I kept telling him that, you know, and finally he went, okay. And then we talked for a while. By the time we were finished, we had a really nice conversation. So this was, I have to do this all again with my daughter today sometime. But but it was like he couldn't. He said, Why aren't you taking this seriously? I, said, I am seriously trying to take it not serious <laughs> because it's inevitable. I'm seriously trying to not take it seriously because it's inevitable. And it's the interesting thing about it. I've been telling people as if I'm teaching you or I'm working on the books or collecting the photographs or going through all the stuff, the articles that were never printed, and we're trying to consolidate everything. If I'm doing that, I don't hurt. But if I stop doing it within 30 minutes, I hurt so bad that I want to just, okay, fine. <laughs> you know, take a pain pill, lie down and just be quiet, you know. So that's my status report. But we're doing fine. And we're going to start this week on a treatment plan. And it's a very specific thing uh, because we've determined a lot of question marks have been removed. Oh, that's really felt good. Nine weeks of searching for what precisely was the primary, what precisely was going on. And it turns out to be this nobody little tiny node. Can you see that little hole there? Nobody little tiny node in the breast someplace that was the actual primary. And so now they know the type it is, and they know it doesn't want to go after your organs, and they know it only wants to eat bone. That's very sad because it's very sore, <laughs> you know, but 
now they're going to treat me like an astronaut. And he said, what do you mean when I was talking to my son? Well, the astronauts, when they come back from the space station, they all suffer from a form of osteoporosis where their bones are literally disintegrating because they have been living in zero gravity for sometimes up to a year. And so now I'm going to be treated the way they treat them at NASA with IVs to rebuild uh, the bones. But I said, I got a lot of bones. How are you going to do this? And she said, ah, tomorrow on Monday, we're going to give you a treat. And I thought, what's that? A three or four hour long MRI that examines the body where you do not move. This is my problem, but I'm going to get over it. <laughs> you know, you do not move at all for three or four straight hours in this. And they don't, that's it, you just can't. And they do your whole entire skeleton and they're able to see every finger bone, every joint, every part of my anatomy. It's a good thing I was listening to Sati Patana, huh? They're gonna examine and then they're gonna show me the picture. Cause I said, I won't do this unless you show me the picture. And when he reads this, I wanna be there. I wanna, you know, so I met everybody. I'm famous now. All three hospitals know me as the woman with the hidden primary. It just won't show its face. <laughs> but now that we know what it is, okay, now when we look at that skeleton, we can see precisely the bone structure in every bone in my body. So they can target, it's a targeting treatment. And he said, I said, what does that mean? He says, what do you think? And I said, it means you get to shoot each one of the lesions off the bones one at a time, <laughs> you know, and try to go after each one of the lesions. And because they're very obvious, for some reason, they're very easy to see. The lesions are easy to see, but it's the primary that was hiding. And I didn't want anybody to know where I was. Oh, be quiet. <laughs> okay. So now, now what we do is we let them do the IVs, I think, two or three times a week for the next two weeks and um, for different parts of your body. And it's a hormonal treatment. A hormonal response turned out very, uh, in, in the proper way. There's a whole bunch of numbers. And I sat there and watched her say, well, you see, this number came out the right way for this number. This number came out the right way for that number. And this, and I, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And then she said, it all makes perfect sense. It's all in balance. This is a hormonal treatment, not a chemotherapy treatment. It is a targeted treatment. And it also has some other types of Ayurvedic things that they are open to helping me do, which are kinds of soaks in things like sodium chloride. Uh, there's a combination of doing this where you can soak in a tub and stuff. And they were open to this. And I was surprised, but when you're a stage four, you know, they're open to trying anything, you know, so they were pretty open to looking at this because I can't travel. And they know it, they've told me. So uh, that's the update. Now let's go to the chart and we'll see the chart on the screen. So I'm hoping um, May gets it up there. Can you get it up? Okay. So if we go in here and we, can we open, we open up the whiteboard? How do you may find? also be able to open, uh, Sister Kim, I try that. Uh, because oh, you manipulate the uh, image if you are able okay. to open. Okay, came uh, over here. Oops. Oh, now how do I do it? Go back to uh, no, go to sharing. Yeah, sharing. Okay, and then what? Whiteboard? No, uh, open that uh, image. Image you have already opened. No, on your on your uh, we had discussed this. You have already have the image open on your uh, laptop. I do. I don't understand. Uh, the I image. Saw it. Uh -huh. I saw it a minute ago. No, I don't understand. <laughs> That's okay. Um, so you want to do this once again on the uh, whiteboard? Uh, I, if you can put it on the whiteboard so I can move around, you can do that if you want to. Mm -hmm. uh, no, you will have to open this. Uh, so what you do is open this uh, image. I don't, I, don't, I don't understand what you want me to open. The, uh, the nutshell, uh, the nutshell image. 
the complete uh, the mine nutshell or white where board. Is hmm. Where is it? I don't know where it is. Do you know where it is? Uh, you mean yet, it's in, uh, my in your computer? Yeah, you said you you would you have that uh, with you. Oh, I didn't find it. Can anybody put it up on the screen? Can you do it? Uh, Meg, oh, can you okay, do it? <laughs> Go out of the whiteboard. Okay, now you set it up, okay, May? May will set it up, huh? Can there you go. See it? Can everybody see it okay? All right, okay. So yes. one, of, one of the things when we look at I suppose I'm a dedicated person to preserving the teaching that Bonte taught. I'm a fundamentalist, a fundamentalist. Let's see, I'm a fundamental Suttabhadan, <laughs> okay? But I am a fundamentalist as far as preserving. I'm very strict about this. So when we look at this, I think we all know about these first one here, the only thing that I, this was, uh, the whole structure here is the minimum amount you need to know about the Dhamma for total success with your practice of tranquil wisdom and sight meditation. And showing you how it's causally related is what I'm going to try to do. So you see the intertwining pieces you hear me talk about, but I want you to understand them. Okay. So we say first the Buddha's quest, the Four Noble Truths, we're leading him. And when we say there is suffering, that is an open-minded, an open-ended statement. It's inviting you to find out what the suffering is. In other words, the difference is if I were to say to you, all life is suffering, which unfortunately, some people think that that means the same thing as there is suffering. And this is a glitch that everybody needs to take note of for English as a second language. Those two statements are not the same at all. Okay. So when we say there is suffering, that's a statement, but it's an open-minded thing. Let's take a look at what the suffering is. Now, if we went and did he do this, he actually has one sutta, and that sutta is, I think, 141. I think it's 141. Could look here for a second. And, and that one is actually, yeah, the exposition of the truths, Satchivivanga Sutta. And he really didn't leave out telling you exactly what this stuff is step by step. So if you go to, in, if you have your book, 1098 is the page in Sutta number 141, Satya Vibhanga Sutta. And when he expounds, the exposition means that he's going to expound on what each one of these is. He doesn't just say um, the noble truth of suffering and that's it. So he says birth is suffering, aging is suffering, death is suffering. Sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, despair that you go through, these are the sufferings. Not to obtain what one wants is suffering. And in short, the five aggregates, now be careful, when affected by clinging are suffering. That is falling apart today. Mm. Some people are saying the aggregates themselves are suffering. Is that true? No, it's not true. Only if they are affected by craving and clinging. This is the kind of thing you need to write down and then you test it for yourself, okay? Now, come the second one, okay? It will say, um, when I do this right, let me see. Okay, now we look at the, uh, the cause of it what he once he told you that paragraph this is how far he went that's section 10 and then he break he's going to break this down he's going to say so what is birth well now this is stated in terms of 
the three lifetime version of things with, you know, uh, the longer version of dependent origination. So he would say the birth of beings into various orders of beings, they're coming to birth, precipitation in the womb, generation, manifestation of the aggregates, obtaining the basis of contact. And this is called birth, concerning life to life explanation, biological everything, okay? But actually, if I looked at birth, I would say that the birth of reactions is the suffering, the birth of the reactions. If we're looking at our seven link chart, that's what birth would mean. It would mean every time you jump into a situation in life where you personally, your ATA viewpoint comes out and you defend yourself and you start struggling, that's the birth of actions and stuff. The birth of reactions is the real problem. So in the next one, he says, what, friends, is the aging? The aging of the beings is the various orders of beings, their old age, brokenness of teeth, grayness of hair, wrinkling of skin, decline of life, weakness of faculties. This is the aging. Yeah, but if we look at it in terms of day-to-day -day orientation, event to event, what would it mean from the beginning of the events through it to the end of it. That's all it means. So I'm trying to get you to look at the point of view that affects most of the behavioral patterns that you're stuck in that are caused uh, causing the suffering. Next one is what is the death? The passing of the beings. Again, they're, they're talking about it in this suit. They're talking about it across lifetimes. But in other suttas, when we look at them more closely, we see the passing of the event when the completion of that event happens and the, that is finished. Then we go on through another one and another one. And what friends is sorrow? Now, these are pretty precise, except Bonte would, <laughs> if Bonte was here, he'd say, no, 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 no. You cannot use the word you are trying to define in the dictionary. You may not use that word to define the word. So watch what happens here. What is sorrow? It is the sorrow, sorrowing, sorrowfulness, inner sorrow, inner sorriness, personal sorriness, feeling guilty. It's your feeling the restlessness, guilt, and remorse of one who has encountered a misfortune or been affected in a painful way. That's the sorrow. The lamentation is clearly described as the wailing, the lamenting. That's the pain of that. Then the pain, the bodily pain is bodily discomfort, painful, uncomfortable feelings uh, of bodily conduct. That's the pain. And then grief. Now, this is interesting because he takes, he takes pain and he takes grief. And he says pain is the bodily pain but then grief is the mental pain. So when you go through those moments where, in my situation, where you go through those moments um, thinking, well, I just wish someone would tell me what's happening with the illness, with what's happening, you know, that's where it can really grab you. Suddenly, this is here and it's very close and everything else. Now, what we're looking at in a treatment plan in this coming week, we just got the H probably and maybe the O for H-O-P-E. <laughs> we, have, we have hope for an extension of living with a chronic disease, a chronic situation in the body. It's, it's chronic. It could go on. There are women that I met there at the clinic for five years or 10 years, you see? So you might be stuck with me for 10 more years. Wow. <laughs> okay. So then you have despair. What is despair? It's trouble and despair, tribulation and desperation. One who has encountered the misfortune of being affected by a painful state in the body or in the mind, you see, in, in, the, in the mind. And then it talks about the five aggregates, but once again, it talks about them affected by clinging, which is affected by craving or clinging. Remember, craving and clinging, I'm sorry. You can't get to clinging, can you, without first 
um, going through craving. So on your links, you remember to understand that. So if we go over here, see my little my little pointer here. Can you see that? Okay, my pointer when I'm moving it around. Okay, go down to where it says um, <laughs> number six. Number six is here, right? And then you look there, contact, feeling, craving, clinging. We craving as condition, clinging arises. So we know that whenever we uh, read something is affected by clinging, it really means it's affected by craving and clinging, okay? That, that's what happened to you. And you didn't catch the craving, the arising tension and feeling and let go of it. So you got into what? Into the mental proliferation. And proliferation means think, 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 think about the stories about why I like or dislike this feeling or why I, I want it or don't want it or why I go into attachment. Why? And that's the analyzing. When you start looking at the why, it's analyzing. But we're interested in the how much more. Okay, so I don't want to spend too much time on these up here, but I am obviously. But if we go <laughs> suffering, there's the suffering. The cause is where we start teaching you about the mechanics of how the suffering actually works. That's what he figured out. That's what he wanted to see very closely. So once he understands his quest is going to be identifying the suffering, then taking a close look at the cause of it. And then he knows that cessation. Cessation is the third one. And the cessation of the suffering, there are times in your life where you're definitely happy. If I ask people in a classroom, I mean, have you ever been happy or have you been sad your whole life? No, no, I had fun. I had happy times. Well, there is the cessation of suffering. So we want, why can't we live more in that direction than the other direction? Do we have to say these things are just there at us or can we understand or happening to us? And once again, we enter the realm of, do you think that everything is happening to you? And you've heard me say, nothing is happening to me. Everything is happening from me. And when Bhante told me that years ago, all of a sudden, ding, 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 the bells went off. That must mean there is a way out of this whole situation I'm in. Because if I understand how something works, then I might be able to fix it. And I was a mechanical wonder. I took the phones apart when I was growing up, my bicycle apart. I even took somebody's car apart once and lined it up on the lawn. <laughs> but the obvious thing is you cannot fix it unless you know how it's broken and how it works. So the next one, the last one is something that evolves. This pain, the path to the cessation of suffering or the way to the cessation of suffering is what? Actually, it is the Buddha's path of investigation, his own path in meditation, how he did that. The Four Noble Truths, where they came from, they came, they came from, it's the outline of how he was examining it. And then it becomes the outline of how he is going to teach it. In the suttas themselves, take the Majjhima Nikaya, start looking carefully at the ones we tell you to look at in the suttas, and you're going to find one, two, three, or one, two, four, or two, three. And I'm talking about the Four Noble Truths. But most of the time, a guy, a guy shows up, you know, and he says to the Buddha, I got a big problem here. This is what's happening. Oh, my gosh. And this is what I'm doing. And I'm really suffering. So he came in, and he just talked about... Uh, the suffering to the Buddha. But then the Buddha takes him through a training session as he's talking to him about the cause of this is this. And then he shows him the way out through the cessation. And in the process of doing that, he might use the parts of the Eightfold Path. Parts of them or all of them. That's what this is. The path of the cessation of suffering is the Eightfold Path. It's a support system. To, to support your practice, that's what it is, and to support your life, which extends out from the practice. Okay, number two uh, on, the, on the chart is just Kilroy. We couldn't leave Kilroy out. <laughs> 
So Kilroy is, um, how does life really work? He's exhausted and he just wants to know how does life really work? And most important to get that answer is to look a little bit closer about what did the Buddha find? How did he find it? That's what we're trying to show you. He found it by watching it a particular way in a particular order that he tried to preserve for us to try to. Did he leave the instructions for us? Are they really there? And I'm going to tell you something. They are there. And can I see it today too? Can I use those instructions? You bet you can. And you certainly can once you get the pieces so that you can see how they're all connected, you certainly will start doing that. If you move into three, tranquil wisdom insight uh, meditation is what TWIM really is. And the tranquil wisdom uh, is the um, statement for serenity. And you can have tranquil wisdom slowly, slowly, slowly growing with breath meditation. But the insight has to be practiced in order to get the realization of the pieces that we're talking about on the board. And for some reason in today's world, they separated the two and you have them spitting at each other. <laughs> you know, well, insight's better than breath, you know, just doing serenity. Oh, serenity is much better than breath. No, this is the way. Insight, no, this is the way. Breathing, it's a bunch of nonsense. It's nonsense. You're living through an extinction level for all mankind and you're fussing about the way you're going to practice. And if you look carefully into the texts, there are some things that they don't look at anymore. And that was yoking together the two pieces. So there's two parts to your meditation under where it says twim. It says breath for immediate stillness and tranquility. That is what breathing meditation was used by used for by the 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 uh, forest meditators. They wanted you to calm down, calm down, calm down, right? Calm down first. Then they wanted you to acquire insight, and they wanted you to practice in a particular way in this meditation school, the Buddha's meditation school would not let you stay if you were getting overly investigative, overly concentrating and stuff like that. They wanted you to learn by knowledge and vision, gentle knowledge, seeing how it's actually working and the, the seeing is vision. So knowledge and vision. So where do we hear about this? The objective of, is the balance of mind and uh, behavior. This is your objective. And the teaching led us to a mutual supporting arrangement for survival for the monastics as they were trying to preserve this teaching. They were got to a mental supporting arrangement where the Buddhist Sangha was um, teaching this practice for the lay people to learn it and anyone who wanted to listen. And if they learn to do it well, even partially uh, the basics of it, just practicing the upper level or the light, lightest level of this, they'd have a much easier life. And lay people in return would supply the requisites to the monks so that they could keep developing the meditation ways, the way of teaching it. This is what we mean by development of meditation. We don't mean changing it to a whole bunch of different types. OK, when we're talking about developing meditation, what we're really talking about is developing ways of presenting it by repeating the similes. As long as you are in a society where they know what an oil lamp is, <laughs> then you can use the simile of the lamp, the oil lamp. If they've never seen an oil lamp, it doesn't make much sense. Yeah, but but. That's why you'll hear me tell you things sometimes that are similes from here and now and, and try to teach you with something that makes sense to you in your daily life right now. That's any teacher can change that part. Just don't change the structure line of the practice itself or else you won't progress. It's simple. You can do it, but you won't progress. You can calm down, but you won't progress, all right? So my, the second side of this, it says you open um, open and um, 
what does that say? Sharp with tension equals highest uh, potential. Nothing is impossible. This is what comes out of this. As you start to practice, you start to begin to understand nothing is, is um, uh, nothing is impossible. If you take things one at a time in your life, the wildest things you want to accomplish, they're not impossible, but you have to keep away from adding uh, a lot of extra things into it. You know, you have to take it purely to accomplish it. Taking TWIM and thinking all the time about your breathing meditation, you're not going to learn TWIM. You know, if you want to ride a bike, remember to take your roller skates off. You can't ride a bike with roller blades on your feet. <laughs> you know, you have to be able to just ride a bike to learn that or just roller blade. Okay. So here it says the highest potential, nothing is impossible. Create valuable, productive solutions for everything. That's, that's where this is all going. We're looking at a person who puts away the past and comparing it to everything in the past when you're practicing and uh, considering that I'm not going to worry about what's going to happen next in the future leaves me one place to live. And that's right here in uh, the, the, this time, the present time. I don't want you to struggle to see a present moment, not now, maybe later. I'll show you how to do that. <laughs> but it's not important a present moment. What can you accomplish in a present moment? That's, a, that's another thing I want to know from Eckhart Tolle. What do you actually... What do you actually accomplish when you try all day to stay in a present moment and you're not doing that, just by the way, it's all completely hypothetical because everything's changing all the time. Ah, that's a Nietzsche. Okay, all right. Now go over to number four. We go to three and then we travel back across to four. Now let's look at these. As far as being religious, what do we do with the Buddha? What do we do with the Dhamma? And what's the purpose of the Sangha? This is important. The Buddha is a human being who accomplished this whole program and managed to go through to the highest level. So it means that he went through a total of um, eight times, nine times to go all the way through he went to, into cessation about eight or nine times. That would be Sotapanna, Sotapanna and fruition. Sakitagami, Sakitagami and fruition. Anagami, Anagami fruition. Arahat, Arahat and fruition. And that's it. Okay. So it's eight times basically. So it used to be a question I used to ask people just for fun. You know, not to irritate them, but I wanted them to be quiet sometimes. So I'd say, okay, listen, how many times does an arahat go through cessation? And I just sit there and wait. Hey, what, do, what do you mean to experience Nibbana? How many times does he experience Nibbana before he is finished? It's a minimum of eight times. Okay, eight times. So you have mundane levels and you have four, uh, four, possibilities of attainments that are happening. You have 10 fetters that you're playing with, which wasn't on the board here. But if you have the 10 fetters, uh, fetters are serious hindrances that are inside you. And when you go to Sotapanna, for instance, three of those are eliminated. When you go to Sakitagami, they get even stronger eliminated, plus a couple more. And then when you get to um, Anagami, uh, it gets even better because you get down for a couple more and more deeply. And then in the end, you give up all 10 of those are solved. You see? So this was a system of cessation. So the, the attainments are like you think they're going up, 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 okay? But actually the fetters are going down, 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 down. So this is intertwined. You see, these are intertwined together. So they depend on each other in understanding. These are hooked together. The next one, the Buddha, basically, when we, what are we doing with the Buddha? As a statue, we are not idol worshiping. Now, what is the definitive piece of idol worshiping? And the answer is you get in front of an idol 
and start worshiping it because you want something. You're asking the statue to give you something. Please set me free from suffering. Please do this. Please solve my family problems. Please do this. Please do that. And over the years, it's in different countries. I like the banana the best. There's a piece of wood that's shaped like a banana and it's cut in half. So it has two pieces like this, okay? And one is, uh, if I throw this up in the air and put it down on the ground, if both of them are face up, that's yes. And if I throw it up again and it goes down on the ground and they're both turned over and the round parts are facing up, that's no. This is when you want an answer before you go to work so you don't have to worry for the rest of the day about your problem, okay? And then if I throw it again and a flat side comes up and a round side comes up, it's maybe. People have done all this stuff that they do. Now, when I went to, um, uh, to oh, let's see, where was I? In Singapore. There's a big Chinese temple, and I like to go over there. And there was a woman who came in every day. She was, it was very close to where I was staying. So I would go every morning. And um, I could have a free lunch, you know, as a nun, I could have free lunch if I showed up. A nice vegetarian restaurant in the bottom of, of the earth that serves people. And I, I always stopped at the temple. She was there every morning at the same time. And she was going through a list uh, on her paper of problems and she was using this as a system. So as human beings, we want to have something that's going to help us beyond ourselves. And you can get in and study this about religion, what is uh, going on with religion. But the Buddha, this is the, what makes it a big question. Is this really a religion? Or is this science or is it philosophy? I, I like to listen to K. Sri Dhammananda give talks about this. His talks were very good ones and you can still find them. And, you know, he was trying to explain what the word religion came from. And also the Greeks are interesting because the Greeks took a different word. I can't remember the word. They took a word. And if they're talking about religion, they meant the spiritual completion of the human being. That's what it meant. You had a path for a um, physical path to accomplish, a mental path to accomplish. And you had this spiritual element that was in the Greek system. And you had to complete that one. And I like that because it meant to become a whole person mentally and physically, you had this helping you. And that's what Buddhism seems like that. But against the world today, when you hold it up, there's always a debate about this. This is not me talking about this. There's always a debate out there about is it a religion of philosophy or is it a science? But right now, I'm interested in helping you be happy, okay? That's all I care about. Because when, and you don't have to be happy all the time, but you can rest when you bump into something that's really um, you know, hard for you. You understand how it works, you do not have to be overcome by it. And you can kind of smile that you know something they don't know. Nanny, nanny, boo, boo. <laughs> My kids would do this game of saying, I know something you don't know. <laughs> and we play this game. Why not play it? You see, you, if I teach you the board, let me put the board back up again if you want to. Okay. Okay. When I'm teaching you the board, uh, why not? Now, when I, we can, there we go. Good. Okay. We, we can go in and out some. That might be nice. <laughs> All right. So the Dhamma itself is the teaching. So anyway, the Buddha, we make these images, but we do it so we have a place to go and pay respect. And when a Christian woman once got really upset with me about this, <laughs> And I was, I'm an old Christian from 50 years. I said, well, didn't you, I said, didn't you ever wonder why they put him on the cross in front of you to, to remember him? All the kind things that he ever did and said and thought about for people. And they put the way that he was executed up there. In modern times, this would be like hanging up a machine gun on the wall and 
trying to remember this person. You know, this, this doesn't make any sense. But in our case, we're just, we're putting up a statue to remember a person who figured this all out and he's a human being just like you and me. And we all have brains and we can all do this practice and we can follow his steps and it still works. And that's what gets me excited. So the Dhamma itself is that teaching that we're all talking about. And the Sangha, hi, okay. <laughs> the Sangha is basically supposed to be dedicated to two things their personal development, of course, because they're going to be able to be in silent places and step back and that's it, yeah. But they're also responsible for preserving research practice, preserving and teaching the Dhamma. So in Dhamma Sukha, when we set up the, you could say vow commitment that we would set up for a monastic, it was to research, pra re research practice, preserve and teach. And so that's what became the thing. My whole life turned out to, to research constantly how to make this easier for you to understand, to practice it personally and with you and on my own whenever I can, to work on preservation by writing articles and books that now we're definitely getting published. Okay. <laughs> They've been following me around in a computer for years and, and uh, research, practice, preserve and teach directly and have fun with you to, to listen to you tell me how this is changing your life. And the Sangha is doing that. And, and in the process of that, they're making building places from the donations of the people. And the key to this whole thing surviving is the teaching helping the person enough in their personal life and lay life functions that they will continue to give the requisites to the monastics so they can continue on. It all comes down to that. And so if anything ever falls away from that line of order, we endanger the existence of Buddhism and we are contributing to the dilution of Buddhism. You see, if a person leaves now and I ask them why, when they tell me why, it's kind of strange because all the answers are here in Buddhism that they want, but all the monastics are not privy to the texts anymore. And that's what's out of whack. We're trusting other things. Okay, so now the Dana, the first step he says when you're teaching the Dhamma is to go to Dana Sila Bhavana first. Okay. And you can go out where the people are for a minute. I want to see your faces. How do you feel when you are? Um, how do you feel when you are giving something to someone? And as whatever you give, that's how much you receive back in the system of life. But how does it feel for you to give a present to your wife or a present to your son? And how does it feel to to help a neighbor when their house was hit in a storm, but yours wasn't. How does it feel? How does it feel to help someone cross the street? How does it feel once a person came to me and had a really heavy duty problem of, uh, and was so wrapped up in that problem? And basically I said, can I ask you a question? And she said, yes, and I said, do you have any volunteer programs? And and Bonte and I are very, we were very interested in having people go into volunteer programs. We had both grown up that way, him in California, me on the East Coast. Our parents had encouraged us to be doing things like that as we're growing up for personal experience, you know. And when this person finally went and started pushing a book cart around the hospital for people who were in there for a long time uh, and having helping them choose books and talk to them a little bit. She was a volunteer, we call them pink ladies in the United States. And her just depression just went away. She started to hear about other people's dilemmas. She started to hear about, get more in touch 
with other human beings suffering. And, and she would help them with very simple things. She was not allowed to tell her story and she didn't want to tell her story, but she learned there were a lot of people who were in worse situations than her that she could just help by giving them a book or, you know, smiling with them, spending time listening to them for 10 minutes, not staff person coming in your room, but that way. And it changed her whole life. So what happened to her? She moved from this side of the head to the other side of the head. And in this side of the head was the giving and the generosity and stuff. And her heart warmed up and she became kinder and she became less stressed out with the problems she was facing because she saw that she was part of a group of people and that everybody had problems. There were ups and downs and ups and downs. And hers didn't seem so significant anymore. Another time I sent a person to a VA hospital and I said, if you want to, you know, if you have time to do some, I don't know where I can go. I said, I can set you up to go to the VA hospital, go to the VA hospital, work with the amputees. Oh, I couldn't do that. Next time I went up there, she was helping them play basketball. <laughs> these guys really want you to come and see them and, you know, get involved and accept them and, you know, work with them. And this has changed her life completely. So any degree of that, what can I do? Some man said to me, do you know anybody who's blind? I said, what do you mean? Why don't you go over and read to him? read to the person listening to a reader is really bad I don't know if you've done it for a long time but listening to a reader is just dead in the air and some of the readers are kind of pretty bad I, I appreciate the speaking books but it's much more nice if you have somebody there that you can talk to sometimes and you're basically there to read to the person go read the bible to the person I don't care if you're buddhist read the bible for them you see what I mean? Get involved with the connection and diversity of the human race and go closer to the people and give. And then tell me how your heart feels when you go home. Tell me then. All right, we can go back to the board because I have a short memory. <laughs> I'm going back and back and forth. I don't know what was there. So when we look here now at the board, that's the Donna and the purpose in keeping with this, the Donna was, the purpose of it was to open your heart. So when you first come and you're living with a group of people and you're sharing everything and, and that's how you're working with a monastic structure, then all of a sudden your mind, speech and action, you see how your mind, you decide to do something and you're talking to yourself inside and then you actually do something. And when you do something to help somebody, your heart is opening and your heart needs to be open and feel good and connected with you so that everything works in your meditation. So this was a step, a primer for the engine to work. This Sheila is the virtue. I don't need to go over all of the precepts, but they're right there in number five. But the thing is, um, you know, keeping the precepts, we, I don't want you to think that this is an order. Okay. This is an order. And this order is that you should keep every one of those precepts or your life is going to be for nothing. <laughs> you see, the commandments are very strict in the Christian faiths in variation to different levels of the faith, the way they've set it up in variation of ways in the different churches, from the orthodox to the medium to the to the renewed and to this and that. Okay. But the commandments are important in the Christian faith for the same reason to keep your mind out of the unwholesome spaces and into the wholesome spaces as much as possible. So it's basically not killing or harming any beings on purpose, not to take anything that is not freely given, not to practice wrong sexuality, which basically means not do anything in a sexual nature that would cause pain 
or grief, physical or mental suffering for anybody. And then not to lie, not to tell lies, okay? Um, not to use any harsh language or gossip or slander. And gossip, once again, means passing along information. You don't even know if it's true or not. And very often it's set up to hurt people. And the next one is slander, doing things for the purpose of selfishly trying to get a job by disgracing someone else or passing information around about that person or, or trying to destroy a group by telling something false by law. It's a form of lying. These pieces are a form of lying. And slander is where you divide people, whether it's about two people or two sides of politics or groups or anything. And then the last one is not to cloud the mind with drugs or alcohol because you will break the other four precepts. That is the interrelationship of that. And we say don't take drugs or alcohol, recreational drugs or alcohol, because that's where you get caught up. I'm not saying don't take a medication that has alcohol in it. That's silly, okay? <laughs> if you need that medication, okay? Now, the other parts in section five are basically, if we're keeping our precepts, this is where I really wanted to draw a picture, but I gave up today because <laughs> of my computer. But I said, if you draw an umbrella, okay, and the precepts need to be written on the umbrella at the bottom, that's what the umbrella is. I used to make the, the um, umbrella like in the shape of, of oh, I'm doing this, the shape um, of like this with the point pointed parts on them, you know, where it looks pointed on the flaps of the umbrella. And each one of those was a, hint, a, a precept. And so you're holding this umbrella over you and the precepts are, are kept as a support system for smooth operation of your meditation. So what's trying to rain down on you? What is it that's trying to rain down on you are the hindrances. Now, if we look at the hindrances, we have five hindrances. Basically, lust and greed. The second one, hatred and aversion. Okay. The third one, yeah, sloth and torpor. And everybody seems to like this, to call this sleepy and dull mind. It seems to connect with more people here in Europe if I tell you this is a sleepy, dull mind. That's what... And when it, you have a dull mind, you stop working effectively in, in work or manufacturing or anything. You, you're not producing very well at all. And, and sleepy, you just want to go home and go to sleep. That's your escape mechanism. That's what that is. And then restlessness, guilt, and remorse. Your restlessness is you're moving your leg, you're tapping it all the time on the floor, or you're shifting your body a lot. And it's coming from guilt about something. You did something or you that you're sorry for and you feel guilty and you have remorse about something you did further back that keeps coming up because something has reminded you of it and you feel this happening. These are the kind of hindrances and they're kind of raining down on you. But as long as you're keeping your precepts in that umbrella, it prevents that from getting to you. It doesn't come through to you because if you're keeping your precepts, you're not gonna do things that will set these things off. Now, the thing I can tell you about the precepts that was shocking to me was teaching the 16 nuns that I taught, the Catholic nuns in September of uh, 2020. And when I taught that retreat, I was really astonished at how quickly they got to move along with progress smoothly with their meditation. I'm looking at why. And the person who was helping me and myself, we would sit there and say, well, look, they were keeping their commandments and they were keeping them really close. For six years, these nuns 
working together, were keeping their precepts closely, intending to go to the Vatican for higher or ordination. And so you're working with a group of people who didn't allow themselves out of a pure mind. They kept purity in their life as constantly as possible. And so this is why we had such high statistics on this retreat. And it was fun to see them go. They were trying to practice this way because they wanted to increase uh, the length of time that they could sit in personal prayer with God. And in the process of doing this uh, and following everything so perfectly, taking notes and showing me their notes and their interviews and explaining exactly what happened in the practices and not deviating from anything I told them to do at all. We had a 68% in that group that went through. 68%, it's the highest stats. When I told Bonte, he started giggling. He said, see, if, you, if you're really keeping the precepts, that's the kind of thing that can happen. And that was, it was a shock to me. I thought, well, maybe they'll do okay with it. They went from 30 minutes. Nobody left that retreat under at least two and a half hours of sitting. And it, some were sitting at four hours by the end. They just followed the instructions. That's all I have to say. Then the five aggregates, teaching a person early in the beginning is a really important thing to get the ball rolling of thinking practically, what precisely am I? It's a body from my head to my toes. It's I experienced in my life through this existence, basically three kinds of feeling, you know, pleasant, painful, or neutral, okay? And I have a system, my brain, where it perceives or it names what is coming up in each form of contact from my six sense doors, my sense bases. And thoughts arise in my mind. And sometimes thoughts come up. I'm sure you've experienced it. You, you're driving a car. You didn't ask the thought to come up. You were driving the car. And all of a sudden it comes up, boy, are you in trouble if you forget the milk? <laughs> get stop and get the milk or get the eggs before you come home. I told you, please. And now, oh, I you stop the car and get what you need. But that thought didn't come up because you said, oh, it's time for me to remember what I have to do. It just popped up. And there's much more than that that goes on, but your thoughts are not totally controlled um, by you, just the same way as your other sense bases are not controlled. And the last part is consciousness. So if we say body, feeling, perception, thoughts, and consciousness, that's what you are. Now, who is it in our societies today? You can put me back where the people are for a minute. Okay, who, who is it that's in our society today who is closest to naturally being in touch with the five aggregates? It's the medical community. Because when they went to medical school, they had a cadaver and they were working with this cadaver and you get to stand there over the cadaver and open up the body and take a look and try to figure out where Frank Jones actually is. And they began to realize that there's something here that's going on. Where is Tom Smith looking in the other one, you know, or Jane Doe? When you do that, you'll never be the same. You really start to think he really was curious about this, the Buddha. Where am I? And he begins to realize I is formulated and created. And that I interrupts the natural existence of the human being to some extent has effects that he gets curious about this. And we can go back over again to the whiteboard. Okay, so 
the medical community is really the closest ones in touch with this. And your experience, your whole experience is functioning through six sense doors. When you talk about the internal sense door and the external sense doors, this is easy to remember. The internal sense door is my eye, my ear. The Well, let's not say my, the, the eye, the ear, the nose, the tongue, the body, okay? The ex, the, and then that's the internal experience. And mind also is an internal experience, okay? It has that. These are the external organs, I'm sorry, the internal organs and the external, this might not have been done right. You all need to cross it out and fix it. But eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body mm -hmm, is operating internally and the mind. And then the external part of that, if you go back to eyes, go back to eyes, okay, you have forms the eye sees forms, the ear sees sounds, the nose has odors, the tongue has flavors, the body has tangibles or sensations. That's all it means when they talk about internal, external, and the mind also, this was brilliant that he figured out that the mind operates functionally the exact same way to have contact happen you must have three parts and mind is identical in the operation of having contact happen. Okay. So we go down to number six. We're saying, how does suffering actually work? Now, what I put on this board are the practice links and they consist of seven pieces. Okay. Contact, feeling, craving, clinging, habitual tendencies of reaction, the birth of the reaction, and the suffering event going to the end of this suffering event. And now this is where it gets interesting because in life, pain is inevitable in every, in every living being, pain, is inevitable, physical and mental pain through the life, okay? However, the Buddha came home and said, suffering is optional and everybody came to listen. Suffering is optional. So remember that one, it's a good one. Pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional. I came up with another one a few weeks ago too that was good. And it goes, fate, you can, this is more philosophical, but you can take it and play with it. Fate is uh, fluent. It's fluid, fluid. It's flowing like this, fate. But destiny is in the hands of mankind. And women kind <laughs> okay <laughs> the he she kind <laughs> i say we should that's what we should really do man, you know <laughs> so fate is fluid and destiny is in the hands of the he she's <laughs> Human guy? the he she's that's he and then a slash he? and she <laughs> You know, we call, I call them the he, she's, you know, I just don't want to get, go, I'm afraid to go home to the United States and start teaching. They're going to say, oh, you're sexist, you're prejudiced, you didn't say women. Many times when I read the text to you, I put she in there and he in there. It's, it's all about human beings and brains, you know, but in the time of the Buddha, they did do that, that everything was based on he, but we're not going to go back and rewrite this and pretend it was that way, like tearing down statues and trying to change history. Okay, we're not gonna do that stuff. We're gonna grow up a little bit and we're gonna start, you wanna, wanna change the world? Go back to the people a minute, okay? If you, if you are learning this practice, okay? When you are learning this practice, you are, you are really, 
always thinking in the back of your mind, but when will the world change? Can we ever change this world? Lately, in the last six months, I've been hanging around wondering, what are we waiting for? What the heck are we waiting for? I don't understand it. You see, you already know what you want the world to change into. You already know, <clears throat> no matter what your story is, no matter what you went through, no matter if you were um, you know, dislocated and had to come here to live or went through war or hell or what. You already know what you want it to be. So why aren't you personally going out each day and changing the world? But people still go out and argue when somebody bumps your car, get outraged, pull a gun, shoot somebody on a bridge, you know, and all this. But why? Because they don't seem to understand. People are waiting for instant gratification for someone to say, okay, now we're, it's all going to change. I'm sorry, it's not going to just change. You hold the key because if you were each given something, you know, colored pencils and paper to draw right now, you would draw what you thought the world should be. But the question isn't whether you can draw it. The question is whether you can live it starting tomorrow. Can you forgive whatever confronts you? Whatever happens all day long, can you forgive it the moment it happens? And then just give space, a little bit of space, compassion to see what's really going on. Can you do that? So it's forgiveness, the compassion, and then put loving kindness into it. That's what it is. Well, what difference would it make? Well, it makes a lot of difference. It makes a whole lot of difference. Can you remember that if you run by the person who fell down on the sidewalk next week when you fall, no one will pick you up? Explain that to me. But if you're helping people constantly and you're giving and you're smiling, I don't have anything to give. So smile and give your smile away. This is not space math, not physics. You don't need physics to do that. You just smile and then you give it away and it becomes worth millions, millions. Let's go back to the board. Okay, and then, you know, when we come into this part, this is where the training actually starts to happen. And uh, I think what I want to do now is I want to stop here because when we're using these links here, these seven, I want to do another, uh, I want to do it another time where we will come back and do this another another week of this and we will spend another meeting, okay? Just taking the contact pieces. But what I wanna know is so far, do you see how this is connected? Now we skipped one thing. I just see we skipped one thing. We said Donna, Sheila, Bhavana. We said Donna, we talked about Sheila, but Bhavana. Let's be sure we understand Bhavana clearly. And, Dr. Pramasiri is the head of the mm, Pali department at University of Peradeniya in Sri Lanka. And he came out and basically said, look, we've been translating bhavana for a long time as development of mind, but it's not effectually causing any real change. Yeah. But what if we said bhavana meant development of mind and it can also be used as development of behavior patterns. Then we begin to see when you start living the Sheila and living the Donna, then that's your first practice. That's your first practice, develop, which is developing those two, the Donna and sheltered by the Sheila. But now look at the arrow. It goes over to Sheila's, Sheila's Samadhi Panya. So Sheila Samadhi Panya is what everybody talks about. 
but they uh, many times just leave out Donna Sheila above and it like it's a, it's just going to be that way. But if you don't explain it, they don't really know what it is. So now you really know what it is. So now you move over here when I say Sheila, I mean Donna and Sheila, you see, because you're already living it. And then Samadhi was a word that we used to say was concentration, but we're, we're going to say there's another way to translate it that Rice Davies talked about in his dictionary. There's a note about there. And samadhi can be divided into sama and di. And the sama is like the sama, sama, uh, mm, samata, tranquility. And the di is the source word for wisdom and that's where insight happens so try when you practice the way that sariputta was practicing you are practicing an aware type of practice where you're awarely you're aware of what you're doing and gradually if you look if you came to a retreat you have the page that describes Majima Nikaya number 111 Anupada Sutta. And you see in each pay, in each uh, um, going from each jhana through each jhana, you see the components that arise when you're in the first practice, first jhana. And then you see the ones that fall away and other ones arise in the second jhana. And then you see some of those pass away completely and other ones arise in the third jhana. And that's how it's structurally it's helping you to get what you need to have the cessation, more cessation, more cessation, more cessation, gradually going down, you see? And when you look at that, you understand that you're practicing relinquishment, the relinquishment of so much control, so much stress, so much tension. So all your tension, your stress, your, your uh, panic attacks, your depression, all of that stuff is included in all of this. If you come individually to talk about one of those, you can talk about the solutions, but we can do that later. Okay. And Panya is the, the direct knowledge and wisdom. So the Panya is direct. You have, you're practicing the Samadhi in a way where it's tranquil wisdom, wisdom insight, meditation, and you're practicing knowledge and vision so you can watch it. That's what the aware jhana is. And then the panya arises as to how things actually work because you're directly seeing it. And you're learning how as you're going deeper, you want to learn to watch even the consciousnesses arising and being there and passing away, arising and being there and passing away. And our entire life is birth, death, birth, death, birth, death, birth, death. <laughs> and it's like there was a song, Walt Disney made a song um, and that's how fast it's happening. And one of my students came in and said, do you mean birth, death? She said, yes, birth, death, birth, death. That's how fast it's happening that's it happening really fast and he's showing you 2600 years ago without a microscope he's showing you human cognition yeah human cognition is not new neurocognitive science is not new they just have better instruments <laughs> to measure stuff but cognitive psychology is not new the Buddha is the father of cognitive psychology. He can show you exactly how your suffering works, which is what we'll do next time. And we'll start in section six and we'll go from six down through to the end, okay? All of this is kept rolling. Go down to 13, yeah, 13. You know, all of this is working and supported continually if you just learn to recognize when a distraction comes up and you just never mind it and let it go. And then you relax your head and you then return to your task with a smile. You, you have the re-smile, you, you, you bring up a smile because that counters anything negative that pulled you down. Pull you down, smile. <laughs> Why? 
Yeah, you're not smiling because you like it. You're smiling because you're laughing at it and you can see it happening. It's pulling you down and you go, ah, look at that. It got me. So now you're smiling. So bring up the smile and then you keep what you're doing. You keep on going and you repeat and repeat and repeat. How many times do I have to do that until you do it automatically? But how can I do it automatically? You don't do it automatically. Your brain does it automatically when it's time. And how does it learn that? Because you kept going, recognize, release, relax, re-smile, return, repeat. And recognize, release, relax, re-smile, return, repeat. And recognize, release, relax, re-smile, return, repeat. Oh, okay. <laughs> Are you happy now? Are you happy? Are you? Yeah, I'm happy. Thanks. Okay, I'm going to go. Bye. <laughs> yeah, okay, let's go back. Open up the floor. Everybody, is everybody kind of clear on what we're talking about on the parts? Tell me if you're clear. Just tell me if you're seeing it. You're seeing how it's connected. Okay. You connected okay, Venom? You okay? You follow it, Venom? Yeah? Okay. You got it, Rowie? Okay. Alexander, are you okay? Yeah? Okay. Goodness? I don't know. Are you okay? Hi. Yeah. Effendi, you're okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, sister. So you understand it okay? Yeah? Yeah, I do. Okay, good. Hi. I'm not sure Moto. Who is Moto? Where's Moto? Okay. Paul, I know you've got it, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's a mobile, uh, this thing. <laughs> mobile, okay. uh, Moto is a mobile uh, model. Oh, it's, oh, okay. Whoever that is on the phone, I hope you've got it. You can tell me if you don't. Okay, questions on it, questions. Dr. Weir, are you okay? I like Bora Bedore, that's a pretty picture. And then who is VPA? VPA, <laughs> who is VPA, yeah? Okay, how is that? Do you understand it okay? Yes, yes. Sister. You got it? You got it. Okay, next week, what we're going to do is we're going to take all of that and put it in your head. And then what we're going to do is we're going to work with an, with an incident, you know, a, an event, and try to understand how we're seeing this. And you need to bring with you next week, you need to bring what you want to see the solution to. So in other words, is this a depression that's happening to you? Is this, is this, uh, is this something like um, panic attacks happening to you or fear happening to you or shyness happening to you? What is it? And whatever you bring, I will show you how it works in these seven links and you use them yeah, I'm thinking about making bracelets with the pieces of the seven links, yeah? And you can wear the bracelet so you have it with you all the time. How's that? You have those links all the time. And then you remember that all you have to do is the last piece. It has the six pieces on there, right? Okay. You all know about my business card, right? Did you see my business card? Wait just a second. I'll get it. I didn't have it in here. Okay. Uh -oh. So this is um this is like a business card they made me and they wanted to try and you see that right there that little picture oops there it's right there that's a smurf <laughs> and this smurf you're I'm see I don't know how close I can get probably have a nervous breakdown any second the machine and the little pieces are on it say recognize you're in trouble smurf recognize Release, relax, smile, come back and repeat it again. And the Smurf stays happy. See this little circle. I have to get more of these made. But 
You, how are you doing? Okay. Everybody's sort of here and not here. <laughs> I know what that's like. All right. So if you don't have, if you want to ask a question, again? Okay, go yes. ahead. Uh, mm -hmm. I have a question about practice when uh, there is too much tension in the head and you try to relax it, but it doesn't go away. And uh, you said at max, you need to just relax three seconds, right? But I need much no, more no, than no, that. No, no, you're not doing it right. You're not doing it right. Okay, oh. here's your tension right here. And when the tension's there and it comes up and starts bothering you, you're holding on to it. You're trying to make it relax. You're not supposed to do anything. And it did, I didn't say just relax, did I? So what did what did Venom skip? He skipped a step. Release, watch me release the tension there. You know, that's really complicated. You gotta go to NASA, train for three years to learn how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And we used to make fun and jokes about this. Everybody, how do I relax? I'm trying to relax. Well, obviously you're not relaxing. Okay. So if you feel tension, you let it go and then you relax your head and relax your head. Just let go of everything, everything you're thinking about. Yeah. I still need to get closer to you as far as a retreat or something is concerned, but I'm not strong enough to hold retreats where I have to sit up and write too many, you know, write things back to you a whole lot. And I'm still trying to figure out, you know, how I can do that for some of you. But the problem is you're still mixing up other practices in what you're doing. And I know this is what's going on. Okay. And in these other practices, you had to do this and you had to do that. And you had to, you know, then they'd say, and don't do anything. <laughs> but you were being asked to do things. You were being told things like, this is your object of meditation, watch it all the time, concentrate on it. You were, and we don't know why they told anybody to concentrate on an object. There's no instructions in the texts about uh, concentrating on an object. You see, there's a, there's a funny thing you probably heard sometime. There, the Buddha taught uh, many different kinds of uh, meditation. There's many different ways to do it. And, and that is that is the excuse they use so that anybody can start their own kind of meditation and say this kind, that kind, this kind, that kind, okay? Yeah, there's a problem with that because if you research in the text, you're going to find out that there were um, different objects that people used as their anchor. And this anchor didn't mean hold on to the anchor. It was just, this is something that when you're distressed and your 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 distraction, you move away, then this is where you come back to and continue watching inside. But you don't watch the object. The object has nothing for you at all. It has no secrets. If I say that, you know, this is the object, this bottle, okay, and I put it on a post and say, now watch it and let me know when you reach Nibbana. The bottle will tell you how. No, no, no. Okay. You know, if I tell you this is the object, the breath. Well, if I read you the instructions for the breathing meditation out of the text, there is nowhere that it tells you to concentrate on the breath. And there is nowhere in the poly that it tells you concentrate to watch the beginning and watch the middle and watch the end. No. No, notice it occurs, but concentrate on it. Absolutely not. There was nothing there. And we don't know how it got out of hand. Because in the beginning, uh, when I talked to those 90-year-old teachers that were in the forest and were teaching in Sri Lanka, they said, we always use breath just to settle the person down to try, you know, get them to be quiet so they can hear us when we're teaching them and training them. And it was used as the gateway to training with a teacher. And then why is it that this could be true? Don't believe me, but let's look at something. Why is it that this could be true? Okay, and here's why. There is nothing in the text concerning the breathing meditation 
that leads one to understand that by doing the breathing, it would permanently eliminate any kind of, of uh, it would end the serious hindrances that bother us in life. There is nothing in there. But I want you to listen to something by comparison. If we were to listen, look at what it tells us in 62, when the Buddha told his son, he would say, um, you know, that he would say, always remember that the breathing is a very worthwhile thing. It's very worthwhile to learn it. I learned it. Many people have learned it. We, we've all know how to do the breathing. But if we start to do the breathing, nothing's really changing in life. But if we go to, if we go to 62, things are immediately changing in our life. That's the comparison. So watch here in 62, when, you, when he's talking to his son in section 18, if you develop the, the meditation on loving kindness, you, when you develop the meditation on loving kindness. For when you develop meditation on loving kindness, any thoughts of ill will will be abandoned. Automatically, they're gone. Develop meditation on compassion. When you develop meditation on compassion, any cruelty will be abandoned. Look, I mean, you can't fight against this thing. If you can find one thing in the text anywhere that tells me you would automatically eliminate bad behavior patterns if you just do breath, I want to know where it is. I have searched for it for 10 years. I can't find it because I want to find it because the majority of people are believing it and they just keep going on breath. You see, that's what's frustrating. Okay, now Rahula, he says, develop meditation on altruistic joy. That's where you have more joy for someone else's success than you care about yourself. And if you do that, any discontent will be abandoned. You cannot be doing that. That cannot be happening. And then you're discontent. And the last one is develop meditation on equanimity, because when you develop your meditation on equanimity, it becomes stronger and stronger. Any aversion to anything will be abandoned. And, and this is just true stuff. It's true. And people come to me with their lives completely changed because they don't know why they're not angry at their mother anymore. <laughs> You know, or they don't know why they don't want to fight with their sister anymore. And things are changing. They said, why aren't you fighting with me anymore? <laughs> it's things like that, you know. And then this is developed meditation on foulness on the body. That's a good one because if you have any problem with lust or you've been watching pornography at all, you know, this is a good one because when you develop meditation on the foulness of the body, any lust will become abandoned. And if you don't understand this, all you have to do is go back in um, Satipatthana, go back to your Satipatthana and um, <laughs> yeah, go back to the Satipatthana and you go to the description of the body, mm -hmm, parts of the body. And they had a thing where if anybody got involved with lust, uh, seriously, if they were caught getting involved in lust or masturbating or anything, that the monk would be taken by about 15 monks together with, with that person would go in the forest and they would work with them and live separate from the whole group until that person was uh, finished. And so what were they doing? They were describing um, the body and they start, it's very, it's a complicated thing. It's, it's not complicated. It just takes a long time to do it the whole way through. Wait a minute, let me see it, where it is. Oops, I'm going through. Here you go. And you start, um, the vicar reviews the same body up from the soles of his feet down to the top of his hair, bounded by skin as full of many in, kinds of impurities. And thus it is that this is, this body, um, there are head hairs, body hairs, nails, teeth, skin, flesh, sinews, bones, and bone marrow, kidneys, heart, liver, diaphragm, and spleen, lungs, intestines, mesentery, contents of the stomach, feces, bile, phlegm, pus, blood, sweat, fat, tears, grease, spittle, snot, oil of the joints, and urine. That's what we are. That's who we are. 
That's what we're made up of. So what's the point of teaching them this and having them recite it? Now, they don't just recite it. They have to do it so severely, it gets burned into the brain. And so what they're doing is they're making sure that they'll say like body, um, you know, head hairs, body hairs, nails, teeth, skin. That's the first five. And then you do it. I can't do this right. Okay. Head, hairs, skin, body, hairs, teeth, and nails. Nails, teeth, body, hair, skin, and head hair. So I'm going like this. I'm going with the five in a row. And then I go from this one to that one, to this one, to that one, to the middle. And then I go from the middle to this one, to that one, to this one, to that one, to that one, to that one. And until you, when you're finished, you know this completely by heart. And if you have a problem looking at a beautiful woman, you won't have a problem anymore. Because <laughs> when you look at that beautiful woman, what you see is a bunch of just change it in your mind to a body and you can see their intestines hanging out and what isn't it a wonderful idea to kiss this person who's basically full of phlegm and pus and blood and sweat and fat and tears etc and so forth you know <laughs> do I really want to hug this person is the whole thing and there's a story in there's a story inside um the the monastic structure about this woman who was a concubine and was very beautiful and men would pay a fortune for her for one night just one night and then she died and when they found her he said leave her there and just leave her on the floor and then they came back the next day and the next day and they watched the decomposition of this woman's body and they said who will give me 5,000 tonight. <laughs> Who will give me 3,000, 2,000? Who will give me $10? How about a penny? You know, and then looking at this person as a body, and this is the way you cool the person down. Does this still work today? Well, I did change a guy. I didn't change him. He changed himself. I had to get the instructions from Bondi, give them to the person, check on him twice a week, to make sure he wasn't going insane, you know, and have him follow the instructions. And in the end, he never turned the pornography on again. And he, you know, uh, set up a relationship that was really good, ended up getting married, has a family. And I think that's a pretty good solution. But he never wants to see anything like pornography again, because he understands. Why are we getting so excited about something that was like that concubine? And that's what we're really, that's what I'm dealing with. You see? Now, it doesn't mean that if you're in a marital situation, let's clear this up, and you love your wife and you're going to have a relationship, but you can't do that. And you should be doing it in a loving way with compassion, by agreement, not causing pain to anyone involved anywhere. Is that wrong? No. Are you supposed to have families have babies and keep supporting uh, the uh, system in the whole Dhamma system? And I'm going to run out of energy. I just got a sign. <laughs> I forgot to get the cord. <laughs> wait, wait a second. <laughs> questions I get to answer when I answer I stop having pain so this is going to be a good arrangement for you and for me <laughs> okay let me put the energy thing in here there okay so the thing is back to venom's situation you're not following the six steps it's simple so when you say it doesn't work what should I do try using the six steps you recognize there's some tension inside you. The moment you recognize that there's tension in your head, and I'm only concerned about your head, forget about your body, forget about you know examining parts of your body, none of it's important. It all is controlled by the head. You're, it, when you pay attention to the whole body, you are denying the mind-body connection, the nama rupa that the, the Buddha figured out. So if you really want to follow the path and you're interested in going down the path, let go of your body, okay? And just when you notice there's tension in your head, it's just tension in your mind. Because when the moment you say to me there's tension, I know that it went through your mind, okay? So what you do is you just 
the moment you sense it, you let go, relax, smile, and come back. Let go, relax, smile, come back. Can you say that? Come on, let me see you. Say it. Let go, relax, smile, come back. Can you say that? Yes, let let's go, go, relax, relax smile, yes, smile, come back. Come back. That's it. So when you say let go, I want you to also smile because you say, never mind, let go. Never mind, let go. Relax, smile, come back. Can you do that? Yes. Let go, relax, smile, come back. That's it. But say, never mind. Just don't, don't pay attention to the stuff that comes up in your head. Let it all go. You know, let it all go. Okay? Okay. That's what she's doing. Play with it. Have fun. You, you're awful quiet down there. How are you doing? I'm not sure who he is. <laughs> this is funny. Okay. Is everybody happy? Oh, let's see. Oh, oh, that's me. <laughs> okay. Is everybody happy? Hello, sister. Oh, hello, he's hello, here. sister. I, yeah. That's okay. The, our, our Wi Fi. Our Wi-Fi connection is so bad, we've dropped out about a dozen times in the talk. Oh. So I can't <laughs> so we'll stay up. But, okay. Uh, so. Okay. Um, I'll check in with you later. Okay, so I'm going to fold up this meeting, okay? And next time, bring your situations to this meeting. Get your friends to come, bring their situations to this meeting and listen to how the problem has a solution. That's what I want you to do, okay? You know, I think I'm looking thinner. It's true, isn't it? I've lost 15 pounds and I'm still going. Yes, <laughs> the less weight I have, the happier my bones are. I think that's how this is working. So we're gonna lose as much weight as we can. And, um, Water is a good diet, I mean, you know. <laughs> the champagne of life. Okay, let's say a blessing. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you. My bell is so happy yeah. to be back. <laughs> Thank you, sister. Okay, everybody have a good week. Be happy. Thank you, Share your smiles. Okay, and practice yeah. gratitude and be happy. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>